All right, biologists, this is theme A, topic A 4.1, evolution and speciation. Now, evolution is a change in the heritable characteristics of a population. Three keywords here, change, heritable, and population. So evolution is a change, not necessarily improvement. So it's not like in colloquial English, when you say evolution, we say like the improvement is not necessarily that, it's just change. There is no absolute best in terms of evolution. There's no, oh, this one is more evolved than the other, therefore it's better. Evolution is, is it good for that environment or not? And how it changed over time. These characteristics that change, they have to be heritable or inheritable. English is weird. Two words, same meaning. So it has to be transmitted vertically from parents to offspring. So here in the image, we have two contrasting ideas of how evolution worked. The one on top by Vicomte de Lamarck. And it's the idea of use it or lose it. Structures that you are using, they develop like the neck here will change from small to large. And structures that you are not using will be reduced. And at some point you may lose it. The idea is that humans were not using their tails, therefore we lost them. Or even this idea that we don't need to use our wisdom teeth, therefore many people are losing them, are being born without it. That is still an idea by Lamarck. And we know that this is not the case, right? This is not the case. On the other hand, we have the idea of natural selection by Darwin and Wallace. And it's the idea of selection. You already had a diversity and some could reproduce more than others, could survive better, could have more offspring. And because it, they have more offspring, their numbers increase generation after generation. Therefore, this change here must be present in the gametes, right? It's something that has to be present in the baby making cells. Otherwise, it will not be passed on to the next generation. And lastly, but not least, it's about populations. It's not about individuals. The profile here of this population is changing. The short neck numbers are reducing because the short neck giraffes are dying. It's not, oh, let's evolve and then the short neck giraffes will improve, quote unquote, and get longer necks. That's not it. That's not it. Evolution is cruel. Evolution is gruesome. And the short neck giraffe will die and not have offspring, not have children. So the whole group as a whole will have fewer of these giraffes and the whole group will be better adapted to eating leaves on tall branches. But that's because the short neck giraffes died. So this is not about the individual, it's about the group. Oh, if evolution is so good, then why did the short neck giraffe die? That is how evolution works. It's not about the individual, it's about the group. And what evidence do we have that evolution is really a thing? Well, we have sequences of DNA and therefore RNA, right? Because RNA is made from transcription from DNA. So if you have a sequence of DNA as evidence, you will have RNA as evidence as well. And because the amino acid sequence in proteins come from the RNA sequence, which come from DNA sequence, we can use amino acid sequence as well. However, keep in mind that proteins can be edited. We can change proteins, we can trim parts of the protein. It's called post-translational modification. And we can edit the RNA as well, post-transcriptional modifications. So the DNA sequence is the gold standard. The idea is that closely related species will have closely related genomes and do not mistake genome for genetic code. Genetic code is how the ribosome translates RNA into amino acid sequence. And it's the same for all organisms, but the genome is the group of genes of an individual or a species. So changes in the DNA sequence leads to new alleles or genes. So you can have a whole new gene or just a version of that gene called a new allele. And because you have new alleles or new genes, you have a change in that population. So you can look at the sequence here, for example, for all these animals. And this sequence is the same. That means it's conserved 
in the primates, but it's different in other mammals like the mouse. Oh no, wait, sorry, this is shared with rodents. So this is probably like a mammal specific sequence, for, for example. But this one is primate specific. This one, this part here is just shared with primates, but not mice, not other mammals. So this is a sequence that all the primates will have. It's part of that group. It's a sequence that appeared during the evolutionary history when the primate group separate from the other mammals. And we have, for example, the human-specific sequence that only occurred after humans diverged from other primates. Chimpanzees will have their own chimpanzee sequences. Bonobos will have their own bonobo sequences. There's nothing special about being human. We're just paying attention to humans because we pay attention to ourselves. But there are also rodent-specific sequences and mice-specific sequence. This will happen for all species. But Darwin and Wallace, they had no idea that DNA was a thing and that it had anything to do with those characteristics of organisms. But they did have as evidence, for example, selective breeding. Selective breeding, also known as artificial selection. And if you look The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, if you read the book, basically the first chapter is basically a review of literature, a review of cases, basically a review on selective breeding. It's similar to the background information that you need for your IA. That was basically the first chapter of The Origin. And boy, did he like pigeons because Now we think of pigeons as these gray guys in cities, but there are many types of pigeons that people use to breed. I saw some of them. It's not super common, but there's some people who breed pigeons and they have all these different looks, different breeds. Even this guy who looks like he's wearing a fancy winter coat. So basically all animals and plants that have been domesticated We've been selecting them and we've been changing them. Well, not changing them, but changing their populations by choosing to breed some and not other individuals to keep the traits that we want. So if we can do that, it's not unreasonable to assume that nature has been doing that for millions of years. And in fact, it has. What other sort of evidence do we have? Well, homologous structures are a good one. And IB really loves This particular case, this is what we call a pentadactyl limb. Penta means five, dactyl means finger. So the limbs with five fingers, like ours. But you may look at that and say, well, horses don't have five fingers, but we do have fossil evidence that ancestors of modern horse had five fingers, and we can see them losing those fingers and only keeping basically the middle one and a little bit you have here, a little bone for two fingers. The idea is that these structures are homologous because they come from the same ancestral structure that diversified into different structures with the same basic idea, with the same basic plan, just modified to solve different problems. Maybe we need to swim or fly, or come up with a solution for flight a second time. You need to run, you need to hunt, you need to hold on to a branch. So it's the same basic plan, but adapted to different solutions, to different problems that these different groups had to solve, which is basically the opposite of convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is when different origins, structures with different origins, they converge on the same solution for the same problem. So you had structure one, structure two, structure three, for example, and they all converge on the same solution. And these structures that look similar, but they come from different origins, They are analogous. They are analogous structures, right? So you have this basic torpedo-shaped body with fins and a caudal fin here for propulsion. You have the same idea. I gotta be fast in the water because I'm a hunter. Well, you have this solution appearing in elasmobranchs like the shark or bony fish like the bluefin tuna. You have ichthyosaurs 
which is a reptile, quote unquote, and we have Tursiops truncatus, the flipper dolphin here, which is a mammal, all converging on the same structure, the basic torpedo body with fins for stability and a caudal fin here for propulsion because they need to swim fast to catch fish. This relates to topic A1.1, water, and you should absolutely check out the video. It's up here in the corner. Go check it out. So when new species appear, this is called speciation. And that's not the change in from one species over time, just changing, but not creating new species. That is just change, right? Speciation has to occur by the splitting of a population into more than one species. So speciation will increase the number of species. If a species just changes, but you don't have more species, that's just not speciation, right? So we have here a finch diverging, splitting into different species of finches in Galapagos, right? The Galapagos finches, classic example of speciation, which is achieved by reproductive isolation. They cannot reproduce, the populations cannot reproduce with each other, so they gradually change independently, and those changes do not pass from one population to another because there's no reproduction happening between these populations. So the changes will accumulate over time and form different species. And the example that you have to know is the bonobo and the chimpanzee. So here we have bonobos and here we have chimpanzees. They are different species. This is pan proglodytes, this is pan paniscus. And the speciation process here happened because of geographic isolation originally we had this whole population here of protopan, like the ancestral species that will give later origin to chimpanzees and bonobos. They lived in this whole area here in West Africa, north of the Congo River, this big river here. But during the Calabrian age, a small population here decided to cross the river because the river level, the water level of the river, lowered the river dried up in some points you could cross by feet, right? You could cross by foot. Chimpanzees and bonobos do not swim, right? So these guys cannot swim, but the water level was so low they could walk from one side to the other. And they saw that forest on the other side and like, I wonder what's going on over there. I'm going to go check it out. And they did. Some of them crossed the river, but then the river replenished, the water level went up again, and they were trapped on this side of the Congo River. And some people might say, well, why don't they walk around it? Because it's super far. You have no idea. This is, this is Africa, right? This is not just like a city. This is a continent. This is huge. And you can see here from the dates that MA means million years. So 0.3 million years, 1 million year, right? You can see that the, this, this took a while. And now we have chimpanzees north of the Congo River, two different colors just because they're two populations, slightly different, but they are still the same species of chimpanzees. And south of the Congo River, we have bonobos, and they are anatomically different, and they behave very, very differently. I suggest you go and look it up by yourself if you're interested in that but they are very different species of primates. The original population divided in two because there was a geographical barrier, a geographical barrier, which was the Congo River. This barrier prevented the two populations from interbreeding, so the changes that would naturally happen over time would accumulate independently on both sides of the river, leading to two separate species.